Hello, my brothers and sisters in the Lord. I wanted to title this week's video Propitiation and Expiation, but I needed something a little more catchy. I would have garnered tons of viewers if I were to call it Prophecy About Donald Trump or The Day the World Will End, and ironically, a lot more Christians would believe me on those topics, but I have much better news that's more scandalously good than all that, which will have a positive impact on your mind and your heart and could actually change your whole take on life life if you were to bite this stuff off. Now firstly, you gotta get this book, Cosmos Reborn. This is still relatively new. I didn't even try to go with a big publisher on this one. We did it in-house, so a lot of guys don't even know about it. If you've read my book, Mystical Union, this is going to follow the natural progression and answer a lot of questions for you that will be popping up after that one. So get it at johncrowder.net. I know I plug a lot of crap on here, but it's for your good, okay? God has absolutely poured out all his vengeance on sin at the cross. But this is where we have gotten the story horribly wrong. We thought God was fuming angry at us because we had sinned against his holiness, and so he vented his anger and bloodlust upon his own son, and Jesus essentially twisted God's arm to love us on the cross. We have not believed in the Trinity. We've believed in demon, son, and holy Bible. But the Father, the Abba of Jesus, has always loved you, was always for you, and Jesus was not dealing with his wrath against you or his dark side on the cross. He was not somehow twisting his Father's arm to love you. You know, for years we have dealt with this huge misconception that the cross was about Jesus satisfying God's wrath towards us. So in Cosmos Reborn, I explain two drastically different different perspectives on the atonement, what happened at the cross. And those two perspectives are rooted in a Greek word that I want to deal with this week. And the word is hilasterion. It's found in Romans 3.25. The word is only found in one other place, Hebrews 9.5. And it's talking about the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. And because it's such an infrequently used word, that's why it's so confusing and everybody throws their own spin on it and it gets translated in radically different ways. Specifically, two different ways. It's translated, you know, that God put Jesus forward as a mercy seat or a sin offering. But the confusion comes in because it's usually translated as propitiation. And you guys have all heard that term before in church. Jesus was our propitiation. And we don't really know what that word means, but we say it because everybody says it. But it's also translated in another way. He is our expiation. Okay? Now, these are words, again, you've probably heard, but maybe haven't looked into. So let's start with the word propitiation. Propitiation implies that Christ's death appeased the divine wrath called for by sin. But another more fitting word, a more fitting concept, is the idea of expiation. Expiation is radically different. In a lot of ways, expiation, see, implies the obliteration of sin through Christ's atoning death. Think of the word expunge. In the death of Jesus, you were cleansed from your unrighteousness. Now, this doesn't mean that God hated you and decided to kill Jesus and said, that is a doctrine of demons. Of course, we, we feel good about that in the church because we think, well, at least, you know, somebody else got the whipping, not me. Jesus took care of God's maniacal side on my behalf. Well, at least I'm not going to get beat down. But then in the back of our minds, we kind of think, well, he is a bit of a maniac. What if he changes his mind later on? And that's where you get the passive aggressive Jesus who comes and loves hookers one day, but then comes back to open up a can and destroy everybody. Because we don't, we have a twisted idea about God's nature here. Now, yeah, if you look at it on the surface, yeah, our sins did deserve retribution. But the cross was not about God paying tit for tat and just destroying Jesus instead of us. That would not have been forgiveness. That would have just been payment in full. 
Hilasterion is not propitiation, the Father wanting to kill us, but instead killing Jesus on our behalf. In the Dictionary of Paul and his letters, which is a great resource, the writers clarify this confusion. They say Hilasterion as implying expiation, remember that's the purging of our sins, still allows us to understand the death of Christ as a necessary expression of God's holiness in dealing with human sin, yet not to deny that judgment is at once an expression of God's love, because the Son of God is the one who suffered the curse for the sins of all people as God's agent of the reconciliation of sinners to God. So yes, Jesus paid a penalty for our sin. But see, sin has its own built-in self-destructive penalty. You know, if I put the cat in the microwave and I press the button, he's going to explode. There are ramifications to dumb things we do. This was not about God venting his wrath towards us, but he did destroy sin, which he hates. He hates sin because sin hurts us and he loves us, so he destroyed it in his own servant body. See, folks are hell-bent on having an angry God, and, and, and they have difficulty swallowing the idea that God doesn't want to destroy sinners. Another proof text for them would be Romans 5, 9. Having now been justified by his blood, we will be saved through him from the wrath. The dictionary writers also address this. They say, but that still does not mean that Christ's death propitiated God. For Paul, the wrath of God is God's judgment which destroys all unholiness and sin. In the light of the threatening wrath of God, the need of sinners can be said not to be the transformation of God's attitude toward them, but the transformation of their sinful existence before God. See guys, you got to get this. God was always for you. He did deal with the issue of sin, but the cross was not about changing God so that he will be good towards you. The cross was about changing us. Jesus stepped into our darkness, our depravity, our alienation, our corruption, our decay, our disease, our hard-headed stubbornness, our rebellion, and these very things that destroy us, he sucked them right down the black hole of his own death in his own broken servant body, and he spit you right back out the other side of the grave, a brand spanking new creation. Now, some of you guys, you've heard us talk about this stuff quite a bit. Maybe some of you guys have read this stuff, but we have to get this ingrained in the depths of our heart. We are so prone to think that God is disappointed with us, that we've not lived up to his standards, that at any given moment, the roulette wheel of his favor is going to hit red, and we all live on this fluctuating roller coaster of mood and performance, thinking God's happier or angrier with us one day after the next. And you're rightly picking up on the fact that he does hate sin, but he hates sin not because it offends his ego. How should my creatures dishonor me in such a way? I'm going to destroy my kid. No, he hates sin because sin is destructive to us. And so he dealt with it once and for all on the cross. It wasn't the father turning his back on the son. The father was in Christ, reconciling the cosmos to himself. That entity called sin itself was abolished. Oh, so you're saying, well, sin's gone, so we can go sin to our heart's content now because we're free from sin. No, you silly nut job. You're not free to sin. You're free from sin. Sin has no power over you except to the degree you believe the religious ridiculous lie that sin does still have any power over you whatsoever. You are not a sinner. You are a saint. To say otherwise spits in the face of the cross saying that Jesus did not finish the job and that part of your salvation or holiness is still up to you to go personally affect by your own self-mortification and inner healing therapy gurus or whatever. Have you forgotten how perfect and flawless and holy you are? Oh, how quickly after hearing the gospel over and over, we slip back into the malaise of religious thought. Well, nobody's perfect. I'm only human. Well, just look at what I did last week. That's proof. I could give a flying rip about your anecdotal proof of the stupid stuff you did last week. I believe 
believe the word of God, which says I have been fully set right with God. And more than that, I am as clean as a whistle, just like Jesus is. That doesn't mean that we can't temporarily forget it. It doesn't mean that Christians can't possibly ever sin. Good Lord, have you been to a church lately? And it definitely doesn't mean we always live like it. But when I base my belief on what he says about me, rather than my own ridiculous insecurities, then I realize I can live like it. Holiness is my first and only nature. It is effortless to live this happiness of holiness, the beauty and splendor of the divine life, always discovering the truth of my identity as he says it really is. Okay, you got to get this, guys. He loves you. He was never against you. The cross was not about paying off an angry God. He did deal with his wrath against sinfulness itself, but he absolutely was purging you of sinfulness on the cross. That's what he was doing. He was transforming you from one thing to another. Now, you better believe him when he says you are a good little boy or a good little girl, okay? Hey, before we go, I have a freebie for you. Check this out. We have finally cranked out the latest edition of the Ecstatic Magazine. We have put it online in a digital format so it's free for everybody. We have stories from the mission field, our last trip to Indonesia. We talk about the opportunity for you to join us again next November. We're going to go back to Indonesia and the Philippines. Read the whole thing online at thenewmystics.com slash ecstatic. I've also got a full-length feature excerpt in the magazine from my upcoming new book book, Money, Sex, Beer, God. Many of you have already pre-ordered the book. I'm signing all the pre-orders with my own dainty little hand, and this thing is finally about to hit the presses soon. If you've been on the edge of your seat, it's coming out this spring. Find this and all of our other books, along with links to full-length audio teachings, downloads you won't find anywhere else online at our home store, johncrowder.net. Whatever you do, also, if you're in California, don't miss our Northern California mystical school. It's coming to the Reading Chico area April 1st through the 3rd. These things pack out. It is not too early to register. We've got discount rates for all ministry school students and I'm in the Northwest in Vancouver, British Columbia in May for our only Canadian event for 2016. So lock in your spot for that one. And my only mystical school in Europe for the bulk of the year is going to be in Scandinavia. I have one coming to Stockholm, Sweden. We're going to have meet balls on the house and everything. First time in Sweden uh, we've ever done this. It's August 12th through the 14th. And the only school in the south will be in Tampa, Florida this summer. So come make a vacation out of it. Hit Disney. Get hammered drunk and buy a Mickey Mouse wind spinner or something. That's July 29th through the 31st. And unfortunately I left my keys in Manitowoc County, Wisconsin. So I decided to have a mystical school there. If if you're just thinking of which bizarre event of Crowders I should attend, come to this one just for the entertainment value next September. You can binge watch me. Now, those are just the mystical schools. Find these and more at thenewmystics.com slash schools. But we also have our Gospel Mania East Coast and West Coast tours with Tim Wright leading worship. Now, these are a little different from the schools. These are wild times of Holy Ghost frenzy, just crazy miracles. So check out this promo of the first leg that's coming to the West Coast in April. When April comes, I'm taking Tim. We're rolling to the West Coast. October time, we'll do it again. We're coming to the East Coast. Got an airsoft, it won't plug you. But if you show up, I might hug you. I ain't taking names, I ain't offing them. I'm just taking up an offering. When April comes, I'm taking Tim. We're rolling to the West Coast. October time, we'll do it again. We're coming to the East Coast. If you're a religious snitch, Holy Ghost gonna make you twitch. Tim Wright's gonna play guitar. He won't be blowing shofars. West Coast, Gospel Mania, April 2016, SoCal, Phoenix, Colorado Springs, Portland, Oregon, East Coast, Gospel Mania, October 2016, Massachusetts, Nashville, Pennsylvania, Chirac, Chicago.